Hi, all. Hi, Hugh. How's it going? Good. Happy 2023. Yes, indeed. Oh, wow. It's uh, already been a very uh, hectic year already, so I wow. don't know. <laughs> lots going on. Oh, how, was, uh, how was the break? Well, assuming you all took a break, how was the break? Yeah, it was weird. I didn't do anything for like two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that sounds actually pretty nice. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of seeing family, which was nice. Yeah. 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 Is your family mostly near you or was that a lot of travel? Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty close within about, okay. I guess, 50 miles or so. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's not too, too bad. Awesome. How was yours? Oh, it was good. Um, kids are still here, though, uh, because they're still on the, their break. So working this week is proving challenging, but <laughs> just extra soundtrack outside of my office, for sure. <laughs> Percussion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing I have noise cancellation, uh, lots of yelling um, at weird times on calls. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> Hi, Van. How you doing? Yeah, good. By the way, is, is it just me or GitHub just change fonts on the UI? Like... They um they do a lot of kind of um uh rollout testing. testing. Yeah, a lot of A B testing for different segments globally. So it's possible you're seeing something that not everybody else is seeing yet. Hi guys. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, Lee, the Google Docs link doesn't seem to be the correct one, or? I can fix that real quick. Give me one sec. Uh, to answer your question, Ivan, I'm, I'm seeing the same font as always. We had a crazy storm in San Francisco, most yeah. of California, actually. <clears throat> um, my internet actually just came on like almost five minutes before the meeting. So did you, uh, did you, were you in one of the areas that lost power as well? I didn't lose power, but I assume whatever my internet was connected to. Did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I had this yesterday, out of power and the whole night and Roman, you're really quiet, by the way. Hello? Oh, that sounds better. Oh, yeah, sorry. I moved the mic. We had this yesterday, out of power, out of internet. It is horrible, guys. <laughs> the whole night <laughs> and half a day. <laughs> Kids are bored. Yeah, we have uh, a... and, and no TV, by the way. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we have a gas generator here, which is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, the Tesla power walls sound really good. Yeah, that's right. it. Uh, our, our generator is connected to natural gas, which is really nice. It just the power goes out, it automatically just turns on, and then you're just basically running all the electrical in your house off natural gas, which is. But is gas really still still good for generating? Because in, uh, in Europe, it's so expensive. <laughs> it's not here, which is very surprising. It's actually quite. It, it's pretty good surprisingly but yeah certain parts of the world it's not great 
<laughs> Wild. Um, okay, I think I have our agenda file all cut up. Let me see if I have any other PRs. Yeah, I got one left. Um, Vaughn's attendance merged. Sweet. All right. Sorry for getting things started five minutes late. <laughs> Between the internet and power chaos and getting our agenda file up to date, we're in good shape. Um, okay. Welcome, everybody, to the first working group meeting of 2023. Um, that's pretty crazy. So I did a little bit of cleanup of our repo and agenda files and stuff. Um, and so you might notice that our agendas are slightly more cleaned up and I moved some of the joining and meeting stuff um, into its a separate markdown file, just a little bit of cleanup. But it reminded me that we have agenda files that date back to 2017, mm -hmm. uh, which is when we started this working group. And let's, what does that mean? One, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sixth uh, <laughs> or seventh if you are include both 2017 and 2023 as years, but six years sort of continuously and to end that we've been doing this. I think that's pretty wild. Um, mm -hmm. And we we did track attendees. I'm trying to think, do we have any do we have any overlaps? I think I might be the only person who's been in both the very first one. No, that's not true. Yvonne is the other person. <laughs> Yvonne was in the very first one in 2017. Um, awesome. And there's some other familiar faces. There's uh, Rob Zhu and Andy Marek and um, a couple other folks who, who do occasionally show up. So pretty wild. Here we are six years later, still, still doing it. Anyway, I thought that was like a fun thing to celebrate. So happy new year. Um, we have a, a well-packed agenda, so we'll try to stay on time here to make sure we get through everything. Uh, if not, hopefully we can use the secondaries to overflow. Uh, so kicking us off by joining, we of course agree to the spec membership agreement, participation guidelines, contribution guide, code of conduct, all well-written docs, go take a read anytime. Uh, we have a good tight attendance today, so hopefully we can do a quick round of intros very quickly. We will go in the order that is listed in the agenda doc. I'm on top, so I'll start. Hello, everybody. My name is Lee. I'm next. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt uh, from Meta. Is it me? Uh, because I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it was just quickly clicking through. I, I'm Michael from Chili Cream. Hi, guys. I don't see it. Yakov here, yeah. He might join later. Call. Hi, it's Rob. Hi, I'm Roman. Hi, everyone. Benji here. Hi, all Hugh here. Hey, everyone. Others here. Hey, it's Derek here from Poland. Hi, it's Ivan. And Stephen, welcome. You're on the agenda file yet, but go ahead and Not yet. I'm Stephen, Netflix. Um, Adarsh, welcome. Haven't seen your face here. Um, uh, happy to have you as part of the tribe. Thank you. Yeah, it's my first time here. Um, all right. Let's make sure we have I see Benji assembling out um a notes doc at present. Um but in the case that Benji has to jump into discussion, is anyone willing to volunteer to be secondary note taker? I can help him. Awesome, thank you, Hugh. Mm -hmm. um, okay, quick look over our agenda, making sure we got everything we wanna talk about. Um, I put this on as standing agenda to just do recap. Now that we have the sort of primary secondary cadence uh, the attendance is not the same across all of those. It's kind of the point, uh, but figured it would be a good thing to just sort of do a, a super quick few minute recap back on those. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we will do a review of action items. I don't know that we will have much to look at here since it was the holidays, but still we'll take a look at that. Then we've got fragment arguments discussion. I saw some um, 
notifications flying back and forth late in the game. Matt, very excited to see what you're working on. Um, we have a bunch of approved PRs from Roman, and we can do a quick review on the ones that are ready and take a look at actions for those that are not yet ready. Um, default value validation status check. Um, this looks like it is a poke from me on something that I almost got to the finish line from Yakov. Uh, and then updates on what's going on with the Fern stream. Anything else that we want to talk about that's not on this list? Uh, I think there's the TSC vote coming up. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Um, the TSC nominations have technically officially closed, um, but if for whatever reason you forgot, we haven't kicked the vote off yet, but we will do that pretty imminently. Um, so you can always look at the previous agendas links for that. Um, we are going to kick that off. That's going to be done all virtually. So I will get an email out to TSC members to take a vote. Thank you for the reminder, Benji. Um, okay, let's do a quick recap of our prior meetings. I have links to both um, in the agenda file. So uh, the first of the two was the APAC one. Um, I think this falsely listed me as attending. I believe I did not attend. Um, but Benji, you did, and you ran this meeting, correct? This this is a whole year ago. No, <laughs> it feels like it. Um, <laughs> Pretty much, it was. Yeah, I'm trying to open the Google Doc. Uh, hang on a sec. I'm pretty sure Benji ran it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So this one was actually quite a simple meeting. Um, it was broadly the, the main items to come out of it were discussing the uh, legal sign off for the GraphQL Scalers project um, and reviewing various of Roman's PRs, some of which we'll be discussing again today, I think. Um, we did get a couple of those merged, which was nice, um, and made some advancements on some of the others, but I think we'll be hearing more about that later. Great. Um, and I think I have next action for the scalers project, which is, they're actually good to go and from a legal point of view, but they need some sort of, uh, boilerplate text to put on scalers. So people understand how to interpret those. Um, the next one was also pretty short. Um, I think the main highlights here were the, actually this ended up being a, a very good discussion about validation of variables, um, which I think we had talked about in the past, but we got good needle in on exactly what the right next actions are there. Um, adding style guides to the specification, which was great. Anyway, we can automate away my grammar. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, thank you, Benji. And then the last was um, an, another step forward on different stream, which I know we have on the agenda today. That was the recap of that. Let's see if we have any open issues. We do not have any open issues, as I suspected. Um, since we got a big agenda today, I will skip over those bits. Welcome, Yakov. We you can join just in time. We're getting into the meat of the agenda. Hey, hey thank you. Um, okay, uh, next up, that means Matt. I will hand the floor to you to talk about fragment args. Um, did we not have any open issues to go over? Uh, 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 no, nope, none ready to review. Cool. Um, let me. Share my screen real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't figure out how to do that. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Cool. So I've got the basically, this is the RFC document for Fragment Args. Um, let me. That in case you guys have also have floating 
Jeez. Um, the, we've gone through in the past why this matters. And the basic point is that fragments as they are right now, don't provide a way for you to reuse them in different contexts. So for instance, I could have, I could build out this really fancy component in React or whatever that lets me have N items in a list of my friends, N, N of my friends. But in GraphQL, I either have to push the logic all the way up to where I'm making the query to figure out how many friends is gonna be in this list, or I have to hard code a value and I can only show three friends, or I need to duplicate the fragment as many times as I want to use it. Um, we already have existing solutions for this where Relay has arguments and argument definitions as non-spec compliant directives um, because they have the directives here have a type that can't be described in GraphQL's type system, um, which is nice. So given in Relay, at least within Meta, I know we we see argument definitions and arguments used all over the place. It's very, very, very common pattern. Um, so given that, I would like to bring it into the spec itself so that we don't have to have, like my main motivation was actually getting rid of this non-spec compliant uh, directive system. Um, and I was okay, initially I was okay with even, even if we just added it to the AST and didn't solve the executor validation or any of that, and just let the client have AST nodes that they could work with. Um, but uh, back when I brought this up almost two years ago, uh, the pushback was, well, why not just bring it into the executor? Why not just have us like have the server understand these arguments natively. Um, and so that's what this iteration of the RFC is, is basically, okay, we have this new syntax where um, the syntax uh, is that you define your argument by, you define a fragment argument using a something that looks like a variable definition, but isn't quite because it's going to then be used as a named argument. Um, I know this bit is a little bit weird where you have a dollar in the definition and then you use it like if more like a field argument at the call site. Um, but looking, I took a pretty deep look into uh, existing, so, Really, I looked into PHP because a lot of GraphQL is based on <laughs> PHP-isms. And PHP does exactly this. They allow you to define arguments for your function. In this case, fragments are somewhat similar to functions. Um, and those arguments are defined with a dollar. Uh, when you're using that argument within the function, you're using the dollar variable. And then if you're using a named argument instead of a positional argument, you call it without the dollar um, and then provide the actual value that you want to pass it. Um, so unless there's a strong objection that feels, that feels pretty reasonable to me. Um, I, so that's one thing that we need to just like agree makes sense or try to come up with something else. Um, the only other two that I could think of is that we, in the definition, we use arg name type, um, which is how we define field arguments, for instance. Um, but then you have to use it with a dollar, otherwise things get really weird. Um, or at the call site, you use dollar to define or to describe the argument. That also feels weird to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, any questions so far? 
I'm curious to know why um why did Relay originally add this in in a non-spec compliant way? Was there some benefit, performance benefit, some other reason why they went that way? Yeah, do do? I don't think we could actually do it in a spec compliant way. So the the problem is is that you need this uh you need a way so we either would it's, need what is not spec compliant about this? So the non-spec compliant yeah, that was my, here my is that the directive has an argument here called n French. So it works with the AST. Mm. Like it no, it's, matches it's, the AST, but oh, it's not a valid directive yeah. because argument yeah. definitions does not have the field n friends. Yeah. So you're, you're creating this variable called n friends that like if you were to provide this to a vanilla GraphQL tool, they'd say, hey, that variable doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yep. And it's also in arguments where the value is dependent on what the type is in the string. And there's not like a way to represent that, right? In the yeah. schema. Yeah. No. Regarding yeah. regarding this dollar use, I think the way it is now, it's quite natural because remember we declare variable on operation with dollar, but variables dictionary we send. The names are without dollar, the values. Yeah, that's, that's so it, it was my always point of I, I couldn't remember which one is which, and you know, but it's it's the same way here, and I think it doesn't feel weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good uh that's a good point for uh pushing there. The other thing I'll point out going back up to the uh arguments is uh to, 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 what was i oh i forgot what i was going to say there from before sorry there's this is also maybe just like a terminology thing that has gotten twisted that might help mm -hmm. um i know relay calls them arguments but based on sort of the framing of the syntax that you have it might be easier to think about it as fragment variables like they are variables because they they'd be within the scope of the fragment they behave identically to variables everywhere else it's just that like what provided the value for that variable was passing an argument to the fragments spread yeah. um but like that way you're defining like the the syntax by which you're defining this for the fragment is identical to the syntax where you define a query variable or an operation variable yeah, so there's um, there's something interesting here, which is that oh, in no, one no sense, we are actually including a type definition and not just like a, you will pass this in eventually, but like a type definition that defines how subsequent uh, call sites can be used in a way that we kind of aren't with like we're we're defining new arguments that normally like for fields and input objects and directives we define input arguments and now we're defining a new kind of input argument and that kind though just happens to be within the document it's the, within the executable document uh, and in fact, when I did some of the validation for uh, like uh, argument or variables in correct location validation, um, one of the things that I realized is that I needed to pull out each of these fragment definitions as their own type system definition, essentially. Uh, and one of the things that I found was, in fact, uh, where did I put this? Do, 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 do. One of the things I found was that, uh, do, 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 fragment, yeah, required arguments are defined. Yeah, one of the things I found is that I basically wanted this argument in the AST node, as I was like using the AST nodes, what I really wanted 
was for it to be an input value definition. And the only reason I can't do that, I like, I tried to have it be, I think I have it here, dollar input, uh, input. So no, okay, I didn't, I didn't put it here. Um, I have it documented somewhere else. Basically the only reason, so input value is uh, defined almost identically to variable definition or input value definition is almost the same as variable definition. Uh, except for without the dollar in front of name. Um, and like in terms of what we're actually doing, we're defining a new argument, which is why like I'd be open to calling these variables and kind of shifting like, I'd be open to switching back to using variable definition. I tried that. It felt a little clunky to me. Um, it felt more clunky than defining a new uh, syntax node. But, but, I, uh, oh, go ahead, Lee. It, it's it's kind of both. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes, like that's a, a, that's an, an argument. Problem. But an but an argument is a is a property of how the thing gets called not right so it's like you i would describe this as these are fragment variables they behave identically to operation variables and the way that you provide them you provide a operation variable by way of like submitting it as part of the call to graphql you provide a fragment variable by way of supplying it as an argument to the fragment spread like a fragment spread has an argument but a fragment does not have arguments a fragment has Variables. An argument is a property of how something gets called or invocated, and like within the fragment itself is like a set of variables that are getting defined. Yeah, the other thing that causes a little bit of confusion with is like uh, because is with scoping. So because you're like the scope of the value as an argument is much wider than the scope of the value as a variable if that makes sense. So like um, in this case, I've decided to limit the scope to only the fragment that it's defined on, not any recursive fragments, not global scope. Yeah. It, like, And I was able to implement it allowing shadowing of variables. So you can have a parent, uh, you can have a global variable and a fragment that defines that same variable value. Uh, and it'll work just fine because within the scope of that fragment, the global variable, the operation level variable is uh, not considered. It's basically impossible to access. So you, you consider variables defined within the fragment first, then you consider variables defined within the operation second. Yes. And that, yeah, that seems right to me. And it's a very simple way to do scope. There's not like a continuously stacked set of scopes that you need to consider. Yeah, There's it just also the just, two. it reduces the mental overhead. Like I should not be, it, it, it feels wrong to allow people to create two fragments that are used completely independently from each other. And then all of a sudden one operation uses both of them and now they're invalid. It does mean though that if you have a fragment arg or a fragment bearer that is you like if you've then decomposed that fragment into other fragments right you have something complicated you need to explicitly thread it all the way through so if you have like at the very leaf node you want to define a variable for the size of a picture that you're going to render that's like going to a field and you're like i'm going to parameterize this fragment and then that thing is encased of like eight levels deep each so one above would need to you don't need to because you can always, the call site can always pass in a global argument, an operation level variable. So, yeah, uh, only yeah. what is visible in the scope, Lee. Is, uh, so, okay. if, you, if, you, if you, and that, that makes it also very simple because then you don't have to think about all the stack levels up there. Right. Yeah. I don't I like that. I don't have a scope stack. I have a like, 
I have I set the scope each time yes. I enter a fragment. And and that makes it makes it makes it also simple to use. And I think otherwise, if people had to figure out uh, like what is on the stack where and when is it uh, applied, would be very complicated. But this way, it's yeah. straightforward. What you can read it and then understand it. That's very aligned to our design principles to keep it simple and keep it explicit. I like it. Um, yeah, the only other things people should know. So can, there was a new, I, what? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm with Lee about uh, calling these variables because again, first of all, we're, we're talking about not more like about meaning, but the exact name, the the not semantics, but naming, and which will be easier for the first time reader, let's say, or regular reader. They I, look like variables. So yeah. it's better to call them probably variables. I understand the internal semantics might be different, which will come later. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to take as an action item for me, uh, basically putting a PR on top of this one, a differently named that is stacked on top that switches from argument definitions to variable definitions um, and still using arguments at the spread level. Like, right, because a spread has at the arguments. Call site. That, yeah, at the call site. Um, and seeing, because I that was what I originally did was use variable definitions, but I also, like things were messy possibly because I was also doing it for the first time, whereas now I'm iterated on this like four or five times. Uh, so it might just feel cleaner because I've actually cleaned up all the stuff around it. <laughs> and uh, another thing I pointed in the comment that we, uh, you introduce additional syntactic structure, which is identical yeah. to variables. Yeah. So maybe yeah, we can avoid that. this. So yep. Basically, yep. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll put up a PR and then we'll be able to see kind of which feels better from that. Yeah. I think either way, you're going to end up overloading a term. Yeah. And it like maybe a principle to apply here is to minimally override existing terms. Yeah. Um, and if the semantics are, in fact, nearly identical to variables, then that is a good sign that all you're doing is introducing, like you're introducing the concept of scope. And yeah. so that is new complication. But like, if you see a particular place where a variable gets used and if the actual executor is not doing anything particularly complicated, aside from now having to consider the scope piece, um, then that's a good sign that these are in fact variables. Um, and they actually, otherwise, yeah, to go ahead. They, 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 the concept of scope, we're not introducing because we have a scope of current operation. You have several operations. We say that the fragment, when it's used in operation, its scope is the operation, right? So we have where to look for, right? Yeah, we're, so, we're and, splitting our scope. Previously, scope was always global. Yeah, yeah. global, we're, but the current operation, you have operation. to search for it. Yeah. But you have, so basically we have it already, kind of. and. You are kind looking of. for matching a variable either on the fragment level or at the operation level. And they yeah. kind of, but uh, it's weird to call them argument here, but then you, you are going to variable. That's it. So feels more natural. Yeah. Um, but Matt, I think you're probably right that they're both names are correct and like you need to have some clarity in when you use each one. Like I think within the context of a fragment, they're variables. And on yeah. the call side of a spread, they're, they're arguments. And the argument um, definition, the arguments are defined by the fragments variable definitions. This, Maybe yeah, better you, variable value, guys, not arguments. Variable mm -hmm. value. Like in programming languages, usually either parameters and parameter values. Right. Yeah, sounds like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, oh, oh, yeah, Ivan. Yeah, I have a question. So, like, basically, it's like two two scopes, like global and like operation level and fragment level. Uh, so, what I expect, like, 
uh, do you think Facebook will introduce validation rules on top of it? If you like merge this thing into spec, uh, I expect like people create validation rule saying like you cannot use uh, stuff from global scope in fragments. Uh, if, if they like, so I'm like, do we like adding this complication and whether people like create will create a validation rule to explicitly forbid this like this like two scope situation? Uh, one one interesting uh, thing to to explore. Maybe if we're discussing about overloading term, maybe we should not overload. Maybe we should uh, create new term and use like um, different symbol. Like we can either use double dollar signs or like some another symbol. And basically, it's like you passing global uh, global variable operation level variable into like fragment argument and in the, it, it will also solve your issue with like php like syntax which is maybe controversial or maybe not uh, so like I'm, I'm i'm personally think think now we will add complication and people later just forbid like um, shadowing like in javascript all shadowing but everybody enable linter to forbid shadowing uh, and so it's like it's a weird situation when I, language i don't think we would forbid shadowing uh because it's not shadowing within a function like if you consider an operation a function, but in my mind, an operation is like the collection of functions within a module. And you can have the same variable, like I don't think any linter prevents having the same variable in three different uh, functions. Yeah, but they're using the same name, like if you have a like global, um, if you have global variable, and if you have a like local variable, uh, it's like yeah, but most... the same here. If if you have first party fragment with the same name as like operation variable, uh... yeah, I I don't think within meta we're definitely at least from what I've seen we would it would we would not have such validation. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, also, I like can know if, if you can like uh, uh, consult with other people, and if you will have like expect some valid other validations to come. Uh, I'm like, uh, can you write it in document? Because especially since you used like previous iteration of this idea in form of directive. Yeah, I'm. Tr I'm basically trying. I have. I have a lot of, within meta, I have kind of uh, a mind share that we should be unwinding our previous iteration. So this is, I, I've, this concept has been pretty widely shared. I will share again within, but uh, like, I don't think we're going to have any validation above what's in GraphQL JS PR right now. Okay, in, in this case, uh, I need to think more because, like, uh, you know, uh, shadowing. When when you hear shadowing, you like have uh, almost instinct reaction. Uh, I will think more about it. The the good thing about it is that it's obvious when you are shadowing because you're not using dollar x colon dollar x. You're like x. I'm passing in a dollar X into this argument that happens to also be named dollar X. And within a fragment, because the fragment variables are defined locally, like unless your fragment is like multiple screens large, it's very obvious. Here's the definition. Here's where I'm using it. Like it's obviously that one. I'd encourage a little exploration on this. I think this is a really good point. You know, like the 
it, it, it adds a little bit more work to put this validation. No. Ah, shoot. We dropped. Um... <laughs> Storm is back in full effect. <laughs> Ugh, rough. Um... Yeah, I, my instant reaction was, is something wrong with my system? I cannot see it, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. But, so, but other folks keep moving. Yeah, yeah. let's jump ahead. So the only other validation, the only new validation rule is that I think it makes sense to require if you define a fragment variable for that fragment variable to actually be used. Um, if you're like, it does mean that if you remove, say, this number field and it's the last usage of the fragment variable, that then you need to go update all your call sites to remove it as well. Um, we could solve that eventually with like at deprecated, um, but I wouldn't want that in the first version <laughs> of the configuration. Um, you know, I, I, in general, have this uh, a bit bad taste about this requirement. It should be used because it makes experimentation really difficult. You know, you try something uh, calling with value, without value, you know, you're working on it. And each time when you decide not to use some variable here, you have to remove it formally from the operation currently. Yeah. And uh, it's like in, in program language, like in C-sharp, you don't use variable, compiler gives you warning. By the way, you didn't use this stuff. Yeah. So what? I'm, I'm, I'm right to writing. I'd be open to this being a warning as opposed to a validation, but I think in the first iteration, it's better to be more strict because we can't go the other direction. We don't have a concept of a warning. We have, you either pass validation yeah. or you fail it. Yeah. <laughs> and ge generally, like we've tried to take the category of things that a compiler would call a warning and like they don't all go in one direction or the other, but some of them we try to be slightly more strict than many compilers would be. There's some validation rules that are sort of nitpicky that are in the category of like these are the kinds of errors that well run software shops tend to up level into full compiler errors anyway. Um, it's a good point. It's worth being thoughtful about this, but I think it makes sense. It, it certainly mirrors our existing rule that if you have a variable to find an operation, you don't use it. We consider that an invalid query. Cool. So consistency then, would lead us in that direction. Yeah, so that's kind of, um, I did consider making also the change for like, uh, requiredness versus non-nullableness, splitting that out. Uh, I decided against it because that would change how arguments, uh, how fragment arguments are used versus field arguments. Um, so basically yeah. treating this where you have a nullable argument that it has no default, meaning that you actually must provide that argument. Uh, like. I like languages where that is the uh, where that is the case. I prefer languages like that, but that's not how the language exists today. And I'd rather meet GraphQL where it exists rather than introducing a new concept. Yeah, that makes sense. I would suggest consistency, or if anything, to be slightly more strict, knowing that we added the concept of default values and requiredness after adding the concept of operation variables, there's some like edge caseiness that we should ideally avoid. Yeah, yeah. So I might be able to have like optional uh, extra validation, but um, I definitely could do the validation, like encourage the validation that we are recommending from last meeting of if, uh, if the argument is, or if the values required then you can't pass a non you can't pass a nullable value even if it has a default value but that's um yeah so that's kind of 
I think that's all. I decided against document org uniqueness because we just discussed shadowing. Um, anything else? I have both the spec PR and GraphQL JS PR on this. Um, and I think like, I think this is ready to get to RFC2 so long as like the shape of the solution. If we all agree that this is the right syntax and that for the most part, the behavior makes sense, but we want to like try out a couple different possible behaviors and just verify, um, I'd argue it's probably close to RFC2. Um, but um, I can stop sharing at this point. Sweet. Um, I think it, you probably are at stage two. One thing that I think would be helpful is to take your PR and separate out the RFC doc that you have that's sort of like work and copy. Um, from the spec edits that way you can have a clean PR that's just purely the spec text and you can actually the the actual RFC I think the do we move the RFCs to no RFCs folder? now this is from before the working group RFCs so yeah. um yeah we we will not commit the RFC doc I don't think oh. cool um feel free to take that RFC doc and stick it in the right spot, you can just optimistically merge that one. Um, okay. And that'll make sure your spec edit one is is sort of a clean one that we could eventually merge. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is looking great. There's, I think the choices you made so far sound reasonable. Um, what might be helpful is sort of just like listing out a, a to do list in that either in the PR or whichever is your sort of master thread tracking this that's the open questions that you're still trying to resolve. Yep. Um, yeah, I I think the action item for me is try switching back to variable definitions um, and see what that how complex that actually gets. Um, and yeah, that's that's I think the next step. So did we say this awesome. is that stage two for sure, or we're going to wait till that's done? Um, this is. I think it's not quite stage two yet because uh, one of the entrance criteria for stage two is we've resolved all of our identified concerns and challenges. I think right. that isn't quite right, um, but it's it's fair to say this is like you know stage one point nine or like really really close. Um, yeah, really close. But it's yeah. it's it's well beyond the entrance criteria for stage one. It's made significant progress. It's it's very closely approaching stage two. That's awesome. Which is um, uh, Matt. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt, if you're, I, I don't know if you're planning on working with the relay team to get this in just to test things out, but um, if you're looking for another project to work with on this to try it out, we'd love to, an Apollo client, work with cool. you on this. So that's good. Awesome. Quick, a quick question. Um, if you had the same fragment spread multiple times in the same place, but with different arguments, that would be an error for, because you wouldn't be able to merge the fields inside? Yeah. So in the, in the, spec PR, I actually am splitting out like an additional, you need to check uh, the spread for uh -huh. differing arguments. And there's some element of like, how do you decide what the variable value is? That's a little bit, uh, but yeah. Um, and that is a good, good, good segue then to introduce actually fragment aliasing at some point, yeah. because yeah. then it makes really sense with this feature. Yep. Yeah, I think so. The comment um, about um, differentiating those is actually a really interesting one. <clears throat> um, seeing whether the arguments are the same or not. For example, if you pass a variable into one and the static value 10 into another, then so long as the variable has the value 10, it could technically be merged. Um, yeah, we but don't I think allow I'd... fields to merge in that case. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I would prefer for a, a static validation mm -hmm. error in that case. Now, one thing that's tricky is if you have the same, uh, if you have the same spread with different fragment variables passed in, 
but those fragment variables all resolve to like the same constant. Um, like they don't resolve to an operation level variable or they resolve to the same operation level variable. Um, and we could fall on either end of like, oh, the actual fragment spread needs to just like, the string of the fragment spread needs to be identical or like every, uh, the resolved string of the fragment spread needs to be identical. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think if you went with the simpler one for now, you could open it up to the other one in future if there was a use yeah. case for that. Yeah. I'm actually interested in how, how complicated this tracing values would be, especially since we, we're discussing not a stack. Like in case of stack, yeah, it's like, obviously, if your scopes are stacked, yeah, it's like... Not that complex. Hard. It's not that but complex. If you, yeah, it's not complex so long as you're keeping track as you're visiting of what the passed in values were at the parent level. Yeah, yeah. So it's renaming. You just trace current name and uh, is a and you trace like uh, operation name uh, because like uh, to Benji's point, uh, like uh, like I think we have two cases. If if you have like two variables that uh, have like identical default values. Even now, uh, with fields, and you use in the same field, like variable A with default value one and variable B with default value one, you don't know if if variable if value provided or not, or default value is used. So like you cannot quash, uh, you cannot like merge them. So like any constant, constant is not happening. Uh, like we can safely ignore like default values, but I'm for trying to track like operation variable because it's like it's actual use case, especially yeah. since we're speaking about modularity. Uh, so can, we have like bread, bread, yeah. breadcrumbs to modularity, and since we we doing it not as a package deal, but as like breadcrumbs, uh, like from from uh, arguments to like aliases, uh, separate things, intermediate states should make sense, or we should do it as a package deal, like is a way around. Yep, I I agree. Um, yeah, the specifically the allowing the top level variable to be thread through when the top level variable is thread through where two different parents name their very name their argument differently but then pass that same argument to the child um yeah i think that, that is actually an important thing to not like explode in that case can i make one comment uh, here so regarding this i think the general idea would be helpful that if user does these two fragments with kind of questionable uh, use but two three fragments with the different uh, values maybe it's intentionally he needs this and in this case rather than be prohibitive and analyzing what matches or not we kind of ad should adopt the strategy of forgiving and let's try to fight and make something reasonable of what what he wants to do of the use of the client wants to do uh, rather be all this uh, invent static validation in front do they match or not let's just try to make sense and try to merge them because it looks like for me it's a conscious decision by the programmer and he wants to do something useful yeah, we've found we found in practice it's having it's it's the ident it's almost identical to the problem of fields that have different yeah. arguments, and we found in practice that that is never intentional. Um, it's always yeah. it almost always happens because two teams are building two different components and not talking to each other. All right. All right. Should do a quick move on. 
We've got a handful of PRs to review. Um, and hopefully these can be pretty smooth going. Uh, Roman, do you want me to go to the call for action ones first, since those may require some discussion, and then we can uh, yeah. zip through the PRs ready to go? It's it's essentially, I didn't plan it as reviewing particular PRs. So basically what uh, turned out in, in the last meeting, when we actually discussed them in details, uh, I raised the problem is that some PRs being approved at least once are sitting there sometimes for months. And it's a bit frustrating uh, and kind of nobody goes there. And I think Benji suggested to uh, raise the discussion and suggestion of making it a regular part of our meeting to review the PRs that are ready to go, if there are any, and uh, kind of make an action on them and record an action that this PR is okay and ready to go and so on. And the first four, so basically, I, this is my suggestion to include, like, like we review all open action items, review the PRs which are ready to go. It's PRs which have at least uh, one approval and basically close discussion so that they don't hang out there for too long. And basically, uh, let's discuss this. Uh, what do you think, guys? That sounds good. I like the idea of bringing spec PRs to the working group um, because we've got a fantastically high quality bar, um, or at least we try to. And so being able to talk through these things is almost always useful. Um, one thing that I will say, though, is anything that is sort of a, a stylistic improvement um, or a very obvious clarity fix does not need to be blocked on me. So if if a TSC member comes across one of these and wants to approve it, um, we can always merge those into the draft. And if for whatever reason, we decide later that that was the wrong thing to do, we can always take it back out of the draft. Uh, so, you know, especially I've seen Benji and Matt go through a handful of these. Please, please feel free to merge ones that seem very obviously safe to merge. Uh, but any ones that demand any kind of discussion, I think this is exactly the right forum for us to talk about. Yeah, but this is exactly so discussion. I understand we discuss, but when it's clear that it's sitting there, and so this is kind of the last uh, stop here. If it's still sitting, then we clearly look at them, which are sitting and essentially approved, yeah. but for some reason not merged. It's a, a reminder, let's review and merge them immediately or right after the meeting. And so basically, just for historical purposes, there is four of these 974, 975, 979, 981, which I think absolutely ready to go. Uh, we discussed them in the last meeting and uh, probably right after the meeting, uh, one of you guys can merge them. Uh, the other three, uh, it's called for attention. They are sitting there, you know, kind of waiting for some discussion. And I'm just uh, asking you guys, let's discuss them. And in general, I would uh, kind of call for attitude if somebody comes, let's say in the, with, the, with the bigger things and uh, proposes the discussion, proposes the problem, brings up the problem. Not everybody has this extra time, you know, to stay for years to push the issue through. If we identify some issue clearly that this is important, we should kind of more automatically move over even without, you know, original originator around here. Th there are things out there that still need, you know, uh, resolution. So, but small things like this PR, uh, they are sitting there and, uh, without any attention. And I actually don't know how to drag anybody's attention other than putting them uh, here. So without discussion, uh, it's just my personal ask uh, to, to have a look at these three. And uh, of course, if you're okay uh, to merge the first four. And for the next meeting, probably make it a regular item. Uh, on the agenda. 
Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Su uh, suggest like one thing we we have like um as as for editorial I agree with Lee it's like can be merged uh, uh, more as easily as non editorial change I think like current policy of having champion is is a good thing especially since like uh, stuff that like previously we discussed like somebody from a guild propose to uh, use variable inside the argument pass variable to argument with the same name and it's look like super simple proposal and everybody agree and it's ended up in like big discussion so if changes is not an editorial like i don't think we need a new procedure uh i think like current procedure like if it's editorial, it's get merged. If non-editorial, it's need the champion. If original author is not interesting, that in that we need we have like a label uh, need uh, need champion or something like that. I forget the exact name. Uh, I think it's just like a matter of of like somebody volunteering to go through issues and assigning champion. Uh, no, I, 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 didn't mean, I, I didn't mean it to go that far, of course, but yes, and regarding editorial, so if it's simple, then it sh should be merged. So basically, this is just a check for merge things. And even if, let's say, I'm not here, it's automatic that you guys review and approve, then go. Or you, you make an action item uh, immediately after the meeting within the you know, a few days, somebody starts, some of the would uh, enough, right? Either add another uh, comment that, oh, no, 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 that's not good enough, but some some action on this, on merge it. That's all I ask. Yeah. More if, automatic, if even I, when I'm not here, let's say. If I remember correctly, we have like a GitHub group for TC, right? Uh, can can like people ask for review from TC uh, and like yeah. uh, everybody from TC get notified? Can maybe we can add it into some document because like uh, we we make this call shorter to to have like a lot of topic and if we switch like uh, doing it on call will force us either to do it fast and lower in quality level or like uh, spend a bunch of time on it uh, so like ideally editorial changes as you said like somebody from tsc with commit right review it and merge it and since we have like uh, 10 people and we will have a fresh fresh uh, members of tsc like somebody from 10 people should have time to merge it uh, so we can distribute it and go offline instead of like taking 10 15 20 minutes from this meeting and if it's not much by tc without any comment and everybody ignore yeah i can i like agree we need to escalate but mm -hmm. let's let's use tc first as Again, a just just to bring attention you know that the backlog of items doesn't grow too much and doesn't stay for too long. Again, yeah. I like today, I'm not suggesting to discuss uh, uh, all of them just for historical purposes. I'm writing down, these are ready to go. After the meeting, let's do it. And do it, uh, I suggest doing this uh, as a part of the process in every meeting. So list of items that should be, it's kind of a reminder that yeah, they, this experiment can you can you try um and I, I will try to find like a name of uh, all group can you tag like uh, tc members reviewers um on on this issue and we will see if it's like this backlog disappear by itself uh because not every tc member on this call and i think it's uh yeah four of us even between four of us, we can we can do it. Uh, um, like, 
Well, I, Maybe I, we, I, we're an experiment. All I say is that it's a bit frustrating. You go, yeah, you I push, understand. you up, you get approved, and then it sits there. So that's the okay, that's the pit that I think we can evolve is if something if a TSC member is approving something that feels highly likely to be done like if, if you're saying I'm approving this and it needs more discussion but I have my support then leave it but if it's I approve because this is editorial and plainly makes it more cleaner then merge it so hopefully that takes one category of things that can create frustration because it's one thing if, if there's a PR up and it just has no activity at all. But if there's a PR up and it has an approval but not a merge, uh, I'm saying it, I think that's it's what safe I'm to talking about. Yeah. But if it's not merged, that's what I'm saying. It's editorial, it's approved, it's not merged. Uh, approved by uh, somebody like from this school, right? Uh, not by random yeah. people. Yes. Ah, okay. Oh, ah, okay. Now I get it because sorry, I misunderstood the problem. I thought like nobody reviewing PR, but you saying it's reviewed. It's not not much. Maybe we can allow people to get safer because previously I much like bunch of stuff in the spec, and now Benji is doing that. But I think like some members of TC or some like new members will have like mental barrier of pressing merge button if we don't have like this documented somewhere uh, saying like if you think it's a editorial if it's not changes back please feel free to merge it uh, if something wrong has happened we will always can remove it revert it later if some controversy will appear but use your best judgment in this case why like, people feel will feel safer to, to do that we can also say if, if two TSCs approve, then merge it. Or uh, sometimes you want to have a second opinion. I don't know. Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it is the case already. It is the case already. No, no, no. I, I know. I, the thing is, I, I, that's still sitting. So let's. Ro Roman, that. I know. I just, I'm, I'm just discussing that to to get an agreement between the TSC members, uh, how we want to handle that. My bid is that it is it is up to the TSC member. So, uh, or or more specifically, when you approve, add a line of text clarifying what the next action is. So, if you just simply approve but don't say anything, that leads to ambiguity. We're not sure. Is it waiting for me to come merge it? Are you looking for more opinion because you weren't sure? Is there a reason you didn't merge it? Just say, hey, I want one more opinion at TSC. Okay. Then it'll be a good call to action. Um, if it's like, hey, I want Lee to look at this, then I know that it's blocked on me, but like, I think what we can do is remove the ambiguity. I'm not promising that that will make us move dramatically faster, but at least it'll be clear whose fault it is for not taking the next action, uh, which will probably most of the time be me, but um, at least it'll be clear. And the, the particular pattern of like, I want two sets of eyes on this thing, super reasonable, as long as we uh, make it clear that that's the case. um so i'm, I'm i know we have been done you're done all right um i will after the meeting i i already i merged one while you're discussing and merged the first one a couple of these others have um either lint failures or test failures i will go through and clean some of those up so that i can merge these um and any that have more discussion on them i'll tap folks to figure out next actions so we'll get some of those moved forward okay thank you absolutely uh, speaking of things that are aged um, and out of date, default value validation. Uh, Jakob, you put this on the list. I have a feeling that I'm going to end up speaking to it, but uh, let me know what you were thinking. Uh, that, that's basically the case. I mean, um, I'm excited to uh, to uh, have been able to help out. Hopefully, it helped out a little bit by rebasing um, all of your hard work. So um, uh, I put a link in the agenda to... Um, where I last saw this discussed um, was back in uh, September 2021. And it's basically just a synopsis, I guess, from the working group meeting there, where um, I guess there was support voiced by uh, some of the implementers, you know, that this was working out well. Um, 
and it looked like it looked like we were thinking something like you're going to do one last uh, check, and it was almost ready to go, and uh, and hopefully it's still that's the case. Um, Sweet. Um, does that mean that this next action is purely on me? That's amazing because I remember that last discussion about the rebase was the real pain um, because I had done all that work. I think right around the same time that Yvonne and crew were porting the code base to TypeScript. And so there was a bit of a race condition of which of these major bodies of work would get ready first. Um, so thank you. This is a, an incredible, incredibly helpful thing to get this rebased. Well, so, uh, so what I did is I rebased it on, uh, on the implementation. I'm not sure if there's spec rebases that also need to be done. That actually I haven't investigated really. Okay. Yeah, so um, there is an open action item in the working group for Lee to re-review the spec changes because I believe Lee was reasonably happy with the spec changes. Then he went about actually making the changes to GraphQL.js. And I believe at that point you may have changed direction a bit and I struggled to figure out how to turn that back into spec tech. So I think that is also on you as well, Lee, I'm afraid. Fun times. Um, okay. Well, then we have maybe an underwhelming, thank you all for hard work, um, but maybe an underwhelming status, which is that this is stuck on me for next action, but I will make a priority to make this move forward. Um, Yvonne, have you or, or someone on the GraphQL.js maintainers group taken a look at this PR stack by chance? Yeah, and my, maybe like previously we had success of separating like uh, not spec changes. Maybe we can separate uh, something because it's like huge PR. The more stuff we can separate, the easier it's like for people review and understand uh, is spec changes as much in like implementation. Because previously we had like issues when uh, both things make sense, but they didn't match. Uh, so yeah, um, I will try to work with Yako and see what can be as first like step to see if we can separate some non-spec changes uh, and make pairs more uh, if uh, yeah and review it actually like last time I tried to understood it it, it was pretty complex one one thing uh, that might me like easier uh, during the review and stuff is to check what uh, what Andy implemented in GraphQL Java. Did he implement like a spec or GraphQL JS? And if he implement GraphQL JS, uh, did they had like it's already like one year or, or two years past since he implemented? Did they encounter like any issues? Uh, because if if it's the same thing with that GraphQL JS is and as I understand from Badger's comment, it's last, last iteration, it's what GraphQL JS is and spec is lagging behind. So if that's what GraphQL Java implement and, and they didn't find any issues, uh, it will pressure or maybe they will they found something and they fix it. I don't know, like one of the thing is because like in this particular case, GraphQL Java <laughs> played the role of GraphQL JS. They like merge stuff and our community to test it. So I'm for, for learning. Um, if Yaku, you, uh, you want to champion this and push forward, can you contact Andy and uh, or somebody from GraphQL Java team and ask like what's the status <laughs> on their side and feedback from the users? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad, glad to reach out. One, one additional thought is is that is that um, there's actually uh, I was noticing there's actually seems to be like two spec uh, changes um, in in the stack. Uh, I mean, one one is the schema coordinates. Is that is that maybe that then that came first? Is that maybe uh, simpler and ready to and more ready to go? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think the they were probably unnecessarily intertwined earlier on 
one sort of beget the other. Um, but hopefully the, yeah, hopefully they can be separated. One thing about schema coordinate before we forget, like uh, we had like discussion point about introspection fields uh, and the use like special syntax for introspection fields, like type name, which should have coordinates. And this was the only like kind of controversial thing from the whole thing. So everybody else, yeah, it's solved, right? Or not. But, but schema coordinates is just introducing the coordinates to the parser essentially so far. Uh, I think so. Yeah, and well, it's it assigning. You, you need to resolve. If if you provide the coordinates, yeah, you need yeah. to resolve to a field. So yeah. you need to yeah, we like, have, we... type name should have coordinate. Yeah, 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 we 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 have implemented that with hot chocolate, but it's it's like there's from my side out, this is actually done or because there's there is uh, no implication to the execution. It's yeah, just that you can resolve reason... it through the schema with uh, with the coordinate. That's uh... okay. I mean, to open up a can of worms around that. Um, if there's more to discuss before nailing it down, we'll do that. Uh, but I can I can make sure as I review through the work so far. Let me see if there's something there that needs extra action. Um, I know we're at 15 minutes to the hour, which is the amount of time that you asked for, Rob. So I'm going to close the book on this. Thank you, Yaka, for the hard work getting that PR stack rebased. I will take a look. Um, uh, Rob, and it to you. Uh, yeah, so we had another breakout meeting uh, shortly before the holidays. Um, so just want to like give a little bit of a recap of that and uh, show uh, a new proposal that we've iterated on since the last time. Uh, I just want to get just some initial gut feedback from everyone because we have another breakout meeting scheduled Monday. Um, but yeah, so let me share my screen. Yeah, we're still on this issue that stemmed from clients being not unable to tell if a uh, fragment has been deferred or not. Um, but in there, and we've been discussing it going back to labels and this execution branching behavior. Um, generally, I don't think anyone is really happy with labels. So we're looking for ways to drop it if needed, um, if we can. And um, so kind of going back to the basics, in GraphQL, we have a mechanism to branch execution on fields, which is aliases. And we do not have the same thing on fragments, of course. Uh, maybe we will in the future. Um, so, and if we did have fragment aliases, you definitely wouldn't need labels because you could use a fragment alias and get in part of the path of exactly which fragment your defer refer to. Um, so we were talking about what would defer look like if we did have fragment aliases. And if that was the case, would we allow to use, would we allow you to use defer on a fragment that wasn't aliased? Um, I think everyone wanted, said that should generally be true. And the answer to that would be that all of your non-aliased fragments that are deferred should get merged together. So, um, so mapping that out a little bit, um, here's like an, a new proposal of saying, what if we don't have label on defer stream? And we do say that all of your deferred fragments that are under the same object get merged together and you only get one payload back for that. And that has the selection of all those fragments and let's also say for simplicity that we don't allow any stream on the same field to merge with another one. So if you have if you have a field that's being streamed and you want two separate independent streams, you have to alias that field. And uh, Benji talked last time about having 
a pending object to let clients know when something is in the works, like a like a analog of a promise being that's being executed. So uh, here's like a simplified version of that where we just only put the path in there. And yeah, so an example is let's say we have this uh, list field that has a whole bunch of fragments under it. They're the same one here, but they don't have to be. But basically, it's just all a whole bunch of fragments spread under the same object. And so the result should be that you get one payload for each object that's in the list. All, they all, all the fields in these fragments got merged together, and that's just one defer that happened, basically. Um, we have uh, three pending objects because there were three items in the list. So the three individual promises that are being executed for those deferred fragments and the results. Um, another example, um, there's a stream with a defer inside of it. And so it's kind of the same thing we were expecting where you get back the um, the streamed items and the deferred items on there. I have examples with the pending payloads. So now clients can know that something wasn't in line because they see that the pending was there. And I also headed a uh, completed true object here. So a client can know that the stream has closed when it's over. Um, yeah. We left this off with, a, with an open question of what happens to fields that are both inside a deferred fragment and not inside of a deferred fragment. So that's this example here. And it's a kind of nasty example with a bunch of nesting. Um, it We thought that ideally it could, these fields that are both in both places could get removed out of the defer. Um, but it's kind of hard to implement that with the way that collect fields works now. Um, collect fields is basically going down each level of the object once at a time. And you would have to, when you're looking at C, you would have to know and go down to the depth of both of them to know whether it could be removed or not. Um, that does lead to like this example, which is kind of nasty, where if you are doing that removal, which we haven't figured out how to do it, it would like merge down nicely into this one deferred fragment the the, the issue the issue here is um so rob me and uh, benji yeah. discussed it a bit uh, between the the days uh, over the holidays and the the issue here is so if you have a two-phase execution where you compile the query essentially then it's not a problem so you can do a pre-traversal -tra and then it's an easy thing to do but the graphql uh, collect fields algorithm goes field by field. So you cannot uh, figure that out very easily. So um, the, the, at the moment, there are two thinkings about that to describe essentially uh, collect fields to figure out most of the cases, but then uh, tell in, in, a, in a note maybe that uh, this could be optimized in that way and then leave it up to implementers to have a more optimized version. There are a couple of uh, graphical implementations that anyway do uh, like two-phase executions um, and let them fix it that way. Um, or it would be a greater change to the spec because then you would need something like a pre-traversal. But the, oh. the consensus there is that this would be a too big of a change for the spec. Can, yeah, can you generally, describe I think... like Sorry. in a command, can you describe exactly like a problem with uh, collect fields? I, I, I'm not remembering. So it's the, like the, we have limited. Yeah. No, we have limited time. Can can you write it in the comment? Uh, uh, okay. Because like from from top of my head, like from GraphQL implementation. It, it should be possible. Maybe I'm missing something in spec text. So can you like write that? Yeah, uh, yeah we I'm can. Like we, we interested can. in it. Yeah. 
we we can go through it but uh, the the essence is if you have over multiple levels fields that you need to merge that is not possible because the um the way collect fields works is only on one selection set level uh, but in this case if we ideally merge it we could figure out that also the deeper levels uh, could be inlined and that is uh, essentially what collect fields doesn't do it, it goes level by level and here an ideal merge would uh, go deeper look like multiple levels deep and then merge these sections together because you need a spawn off defer right so there, there could be also another solution and uh, that would be to hold off the spawning of defer until we fully traversed no like here Correct fields give you like correct fields operate on kind of multi cursor. If, if you waste so, code analogy, yeah. it's like uh, you have cursor on nested objects and so, you see one of them is under defer, one of them is not under defer. So it's winning. I, I know. Look, look at the first example. You, you see F2, ABC, D, F, H, H, I. So ideally, yeah. we, we get H already in the first fetch so this mu mu uh, this needs to be removed on the, of the defer the h uh, because we got it in the first fetch so yeah, since yeah. this so, is much but this doesn't so work co co because we because we spawn no. off the defer already in the first selection set yeah, yeah we should I, not I think spawn it's... until like and like f2 clearly wins so like you can call resolver for F2 synchronously because you have it synchronous, uh, you have it not under default. Sure. So sure. you run F2, you run C because it's also not under default and collect field all of that. And when you finally get to, um, to H, uh, like- uh, Then you already you, have spawned you, off uh, defer no no but you didn't spawn because you saw like f2 is like existing synchronous version so you didn't spawn at f2 you didn't spawn at c you didn't spawn at f because like when you collect in fields you you looking at f2 and see f2 not under default so i understand you should not spawn yeah well i i don't, I don't think we're going to figure it out right now. Um, I, I did yeah, try yeah. to plant around some issues. So I'll, I'll write a detailed comment and we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, what what I, I do mostly want to hear if anyone um, has opinions on is, this, is the idea of merging the defers together um, into a single response. Um, it would, things would work very ideally if we do figure out that merging. If if we're not, there is this this case where you could have uh, multiple responses coming back to the same path. Um, but I'm a but little yeah. surprised at I'm I'm a little surprised at the proposed removal of the you had like an ID field or like some non identifier that described a, like a unique promise equivalent in here. Um, and I think maybe it's not safe to assume that a path uniquely identifies that you want to get that back. Uh, but to your question on merging defers, I do think that that will be the expected behavior that most people will have. Like I think most of the most of the examples that you've shown in this comment make a lot of sense to me. Whether we can get the behavior to actually work that way is a separate story. Um, but it. I, you know, I do think that if you encounter two separate branches of fragments that both encounter to defer, that you would, at the same level, that you would kind of expect a single batch to come back with those in place. That makes a lot of sense. Um, does this, is the idea to completely remove label or just to make label optional such that this is the default behavior? Because it, it did seem useful, but maybe not necessary. To have the, the the ability to say like yes these two defers are at the same level but i explicitly do not want them to be merged i want them to come back as two payloads because the second one is you know not urgent but i need it and this third one is very expensive and slow but i also yeah. it, it, you know what i mean I, i'm thinking that like we we do drop label entirely and um 
there is a workaround like fragment aliases would be the answer to get that behavior of you want you care about one defer payload more than another one um there is another workaround that could be done where you alias the parent field that has the deferred fragment and that'll give you two separate paths then we essentially uh, sorted that out so with that it's possible to to explicitly address that with the aliasing of fragments but uh in order not to block it now with another proposal that we need we just uh, essentially skipped it out and the the problem is that label was never enough for, for what we wanted to do um and the original intent was not to prevent the merging so it it feels not right to have the label there yeah um one thing that i'll say is it is much better to have like we can we can always add functionality that results in multiple payloads rather than one like it's i think it is more painful to go from a default behavior of multiple payloads to one that later causes them to be merged as opposed to the other way around like this is this a simpler possible payload um and label was always a little confusing to me and i i think like many many years ago we discussed the idea of having like priority as like an integer be a thing here that would cause them to be split um and then like ordered in their delivery in some way so it seems like there's like a future follow work that we could consider that re unmerges them so i i think i'm in favor of this of this direction where merging is the way that these work and also like the the aggressive merging is more in line what we anyway do on the field level so it feels more graphql -y. so what we do yeah. in other places yeah and and to be clear the merge like this case um is definitely doable easily implementable it's just the uh, like collect fields can easily be updated to return not just one selection set but two selection sets here's all the deferred fields and all the non-deferred fields it's just the specifically how do we take stuff out of the deferred fields if they're already in the non-deferred fields that's where the uh, open question is right now yeah that makes sense because you don't want to be fetching them twice if it's already been fetched and delivered yeah Yeah, and we have another breakout uh, uh, meeting where we want to, I think, discuss this. Yeah, so we'll keep iterating and I'll report back next time. Cool. The direction seems very promising. I, like from a first principles point of view, these all make a lot of sense to me. So I think it all ultimately gets down to, can it be implemented in a way that feels reasonable? So yeah, yeah. And, awesome work. And just, just a quick note, you mentioned the ID. Um, I didn't include it here just to have one less concept, but that's like an optimization that we could add or not add. Um, not uh, totally sold in either direction right now. Okay. On that. I just haven't really been focusing on that. Makes sense. All right, that's time. Um, thank you all for the ample conversation. Good topics. See you all in the next meeting. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.